If you look two, three, four, five down, years down the road, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think the United States of all countries is in the best position to take advantage of this new supply chain world that I described. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst James Rickards. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Jim, where he explains why today's inflation will give way to painful disinflation and deflation that will pull the markets and the economy down further in the coming year, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Jim also kindly shares the portfolio allocation that he thinks will weather the coming storm best, so be sure to stick around for that. All right, let's get started watching part two of our interview with James Rickards. And it sounds like you're saying, hey, well, even though we're all focused on inflation right now, the bigger bad in the story is the deflation one. Well, I, I agree with that. First of all, I, I agree with uh, Lacey's analysis. I've known him for a long time and uh, one of the great minds. I follow his work uh, um, very closely. Um, but I, I, it's not that I disagree with them, but I would just add a little color, which is, yeah, there is an inflation dragon and you do have to slay it. And we will. I believe we will. But um, it's going to come at an extremely high cost. When you say I'm sanguine about inflation coming down, well, I expect inflation to come down, but I'm not exactly sanguine about anything because the, the that that's going to come in the face of it, what's already an economic slowdown. My point is, I think the Fed could get inflation under control by doing nothing right now. Right, uh, right. Because yeah, your, your this, point this is, is it should be doing less. <laughs> because, because this is supply side, not demand side. If it were demand side, I would disagree. Demand side, you got you to gotta crush it. But if you have supply side inflation, see, the Fed doesn't have any supply side tools, right? The Fed doesn't drill for oil. They don't drive trucks. They don't uh, plant crops. They don't, you know, right. Central goods. banking policy is useless they, against they don't, uh, they don't. They don't work in push. warehouses. They can't do a thing. What they can do is work on the demand side to get interest rates high enough, mortgage rates high enough, money tight enough, et cetera. It will crush demand. But since the inflation is coming from the supply side, not the demand side, how much do you have to crush demand to actually reduce inflation? You got to like, you've got to squash it like a bug. I mean, you really have to destroy it to the point that you're going to get this recession and bear a severe one. And bear in mind, behind the curtain of the international monetary system is this liquidity crisis, which I described, which is not directly related to either the supply side or the recession. I mean, those are, those are economic phenomena that have a life of their own. But you throw a liquidity crisis on top of it. And again, 1998 was an example of a global liquidity crisis that was, there was no recession. I mean, the economy, uh, the macro economy was doing fine. And we, we, we went for two more years. You know, NASDAQ went to, uh, uh, you know, it crashed 85%. But, um, you know, NASDAQ peaked in January 1st, 2000. So, you know, 99 and uh, 98 and 99, after the Russia long-term capital management crisis, that was when you know you had the, you know, the sock puppet and JDSU and uh, you know uh, all these tech stocks right. going to the moon, etc. Uh, but there was no recession. Um, but we're kind of heading for both, and the Fed doesn't see either one of them. They're not looking. Hey, like it's, it's not like I have secret data. Like I broke into a safe or something. I mean, it's, the data is there. They just don't know enough to look at it. They don't understand. I mean, for, and Janet Yellen, she's a treasury. She she doesn't understand any of this. Uh, I don't know what she. She's a labor economist and a statistics geek. I she I can't. I've seen no sign that she knows anything about monetary policy or fiscal policy. Uh, Powell's better. Uh, I think he has the benefit of being a lawyer instead of an economist. I think economists can be a handicap in the situation, but um, but lawyers are good at looking at both sides of the issue and being balanced. Um, but, uh, but he relies on the staff and the staff doesn't really understand what we're talking about. There are actually very few people who do. Um, and so there, this, the, the system's flashing red in the famous words of George Tanner, but no one's looking. Right. Right. So, I mean, the problem, as I hear you say it and makes, I agree with it, which is that the, the you know, the fed was, well, so many of the. So, so many of the, the issues we're dealing with were, were created in large part by the Fed, but the Fed created the, the conditions that then led to the inflation that, that we're now dealing with. I think you would say they were too slow to act. 
In other words, they said, ah, it's transitory. You don't need to worry about it. They were still doing 120 billion a month of QE, you know, all through 2021, making the inflation we're dealing with even worse than it needed to be. Now it's on the other side of the coin where they are tightening, I think, more aggressively or for longer than you think they should because we're heading into recession and the impact all that policy is going to make that even worse and, and deeper. Right, right. Um, I, I just want to dig on this one thing just a little bit further. So we talked about your response to Lacey. I just interviewed Jim Grant last week and Jim, you know, talking about getting inflation under control made the analogy of it. It's kind of like one of those, it, it can be kind of like one of those coal seam fires. And this is what it was like in the seventies where you think you get it under control and then all of a sudden it erupts again later on because it's been smoldering beneath the surface. I don't think you look at it that way. I think you seem to think that like, no, like once that, once it comes down here in, in the situation that we're in now, um, inflation, you know, high prices will cure high prices. And then the deflationary disinfl disinflation, disinflationary deflationary problem is really going to be the bigger morass that we're going to be trying to extricate ourselves. Yeah. How, how is shutting down German manufacturing inflationary? That's, that's the biggest deflationary drag I can think of. Yeah. Um, if, you know, and again, I'm a admirer of Jim Grant, but if you don't distinguish between the supply side and the demand side, the way I just did, you're going to miss what we're talking about. You're not going to get it because if this were coming from the demand side, I would, I would, yeah, coal seam fire, uh, keep raising rates, do what you have to do, beat Paul Volcker. That might be the solution. That is not the problem. The problem is coming from the supply side, the supply chain, which of course is what my book is about. Um, and it's, it's breaking down in new ways. And people say, uh, hey, today, you know, because a year ago or six months ago, when I was writing you know, parts of the book, there was a shortage of containers, a container, you know, the, 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 the cargo vessel containers that they move stuff in, intermodal and all that. And there was a shortage and the prices were skyrocketing. Today, the prices have come down so far that the governor of Arizona is using them to build stack too high, which is like 40 feet to build this great wall along the Arizona-Mexico border, uh, which is great because they're cheap and that's quick to do. And if you punch a hole in the container, you're just inside the container. You got to get out the other side. So, um, so, so everyone's like, oh, the supply chain crisis is over. No, maybe the container crisis is over, but the supply chain crisis is far from over. Just look at what's going on with diesel fuel. Um, we're down to uh, 25 days supply, probably going to run out around November 21st. I mean, run out. That will shut down the economy faster than COVID, pandemic, war, anything you can think of. And people go, well, normal supplies around 30. So what's the big deal if it's 25 days? The answer is you can't replace it. If you go from 30 to 25 days supply, we say, okay, fill up the tank, you know, send me some more diesel, get back to 30. Okay, that's not what's happening. They can't replace it because the constraint, it's not crude oil. There's no oil shortage. It's refining capacity. You don't put crude oil in a truck gas tank. You put diesel fuel, but you got to run it. It's a distilled product. You got to run it through a refinery. And there's a, a severe refinery shortage. A couple of them are uh, uh, constrained. A couple of them are shut down. And this stuff is infungible. I mean, the for gasoline and kerosene, jet fuel, you want what's called light sweet crew, which is lower sulfur content, lower viscosity. For diesel, they like the heavier, you know, the thick, uh, the blacker stuff. Uh, well, that comes from Russia. I mean, so this is the point I make about the supply chain. And I go on, you know, in some depth about this. But the bottom line is, the supply chain is not part of the economy. The supply chain is the economy. Everything you can think of from you know my microphone to your camera to the furniture to your studio comes from a supply chain, the clothes we're wearing, the food we eat, everything. And so if that is dysfunctional, which it is, it's the start of enormous, uh, enormous economic problems. All right, Jim, uh, so many questions for you, um, high level. Um, so you talked about the world kind of break, the world trading partners breaking into sort of two members only groups here. Right. Um, you also talked about how um, this, you know our supply chains might cost a little bit more going forward because we're kind of building the insurance to make them more resilient, right, Correct. more secure. Right. Um, so is the global economy high that at least we in the West participate in going to be sort of shrinking a bit because we are now not going to be trading as much with other players that we were trading with before. And, and what's left over from that pie for everybody to eat, is that going to be less too, because we have higher costs in the system? General, general question is, is are we sort of staring at a future of less? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Growth? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I've given a very dire uh, short run forecast to maybe one year forecast. 
If you look two, three, four, five down, years down the road, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think the United States of all countries is in the best position to take advantage of this new supply chain world that I described. Now, we can, we're very capable of screwing up with bad public policy, and we're going through a really rough patch right now. I mean, Biden, uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, he's, he's not really in charge. The, the people who are don't understand the economy, don't understand what we're talking about. They live in an ideological bubble. This whole green new, I call it the green new scam. You know, the, the, the real science of climate change, there's no existential crisis. There's no imminent uh, catastrophe. Sea levels are rising seven inches every hundred years, uh, which they have been for a long time, by the way, long before the carbon emissions grew. That's not uh, anything related to carbon. And um, it's not going to inundate the New York City subways uh, ever. So, um, but that is driving policy. Uh, you know, Germany just announced yesterday that they're reopening, uh, I believe it's five or seven coal burning plants. And by the way, they burn lignite, which is a, a really particularly dirty form of coal. Don't, please don't tell Greta, I don't want to ruin her day. But the point being, um, yeah, they're, they're turning on the uranium plants, they're opening new coal plants. Uh, wind doesn't work, solar doesn't work. By the way, this, where I'm coming to you, this whole, everything you're looking at is solar powered off grid. It's the largest non-commercial off-grid solar field in New England. Um, but I didn't build it because of the Green New Scam. I built it in case the power grid goes down. That's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the point being, yeah, with bad public policy, we can screw it up. But assuming that's not the case, the U.S. stands to benefit. I mean, Taiwan Semiconductor just announced, recently announced $10 billion plus investment in a new fab, a fabrication plant for semiconductors. I believe it's in Texas. Intel's building something comparable in Oregon. Well, why all of a sudden are all the semiconductor people building huge plants in the United States, not in Taiwan or China for that matter? Well, the answer is we have a plan, a military has a plan called the broken nest theory. If China invades Taiwan, I don't know what the seventh fleet might do, but I do know that we will destroy Taiwan semiconductors facilities in Taiwan. Like if the Chinese take over, there'll be nothing left. Um, all that That's why Taiwan's moving into the United States. So to your question, Adam, and to my point, the U.S. will be the biggest beneficiary of this because we have the greatest capability to do it. And, and you know, and, and friendly trading partners like Japan and Australia and Canada and others, although Canada is leaning a little in the fascist direction, maybe they'll align with China. But the, the point being, um, this new network will benefit the United States because we're in the best position to take advantage of it. All right. Two last questions. The second of which is going to be where should folks go to get your book? But how can investors play this opportunity that you just mentioned there? Well, um, you know, I'll, I'll say something that sounds obvious, but isn't. I mean, obviously, the way to do it is diversification. And everyone yawns. Go, oh, yeah. Diversification. We know that. Like what? Yeah, that's what's the big deal about that? Well, the fact is people don't understand diversification. I run into people all the time. They say, well, I'm fully diversified. I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, you know, mining and minerals, et cetera. I say, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class. It's called stocks. And they're all going to go down together or up together, as the case may be. Um, real diversification, have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stocks. Have a significant slice of cash. Uh, which is a low return, but in deflation, it could be your best performing asset in real terms. Um, but it also gives you huge optionality when everything else collapses. You can be the one who goes shopping for the bargains. And by the way, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett have $130 billion in cash. They see what, I'm, what I see and they're ready. Um, so right. I and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm guessing with the deflation you see ahead, you see better bargains ahead here. Yeah, because because this uh, the stock market's going to crash. I mean, that's it, every, just take everything we're saying. You know, recession, higher unemployment, lower margins, supply chain disruption, you know, et cetera, energy disruption, shutting down. That's going to that's going to destroy corporate profits. So that's that's in the cards. It doesn't mean the end of the world. It means you go shopping and pick up some bargains, but not yet. Um, and uh, you know, slice of gold. I recommend ten percent, not fifty. You know, people. People love to put words in your mouth. Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't believe that. But I think a 10% slice is right. This room, uh, if you want to pick stocks, I like uh, you know, the, oil, the oil majors. They're, you know, forget Greta and forget Julian Tett, my friend of the Financial Times, who's a climate alarmist. Forget all that stuff. We're not getting away from oil and natural gas for decades, if not longer. Those stocks have been beaten down. You know, BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil look really good. Um 
and uh, you know, there's room for private equity, some you know, venture tech startups, a real estate, uh, not commercial, but residential farms. Um, these are all, and, and that's a diversified portfolio. So if you've got gold over here, stocks over here, cash, real estate, private equity, natural resources in the middle, that's diversified. One thing you didn't mention there was bonds. Now, interest rates have been going up, slamming bond prices, but but all of a sudden, bond yields are beginning to look pretty attractive I, in certain I love, cases. I love, I love, I love uh, yeah, you're right. I love uh, 10-year treasury notes, and if they're a little too volatile for your taste, two-year treasury notes uh, will do just fine. But yeah, rates are going to come down. And when rates are this low, there's something called the DBO1 dollar value of one basis point. In other words, for a given amount of rate reduction, the capital gain is greater when rates are lower. It's just bond math. So uh, at these levels, you can see some very good capital gains. All right. Well, Jim, thanks for giving us so much time. Where should folks go to get this book? Just Amazon? You, you can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's available for pre, pre-order now. The publication day is December 6th. But um, you can you can order it right now. Uh, and the same thing, we'll have uh, there's an audio book version. Some people like that. Uh, I read it myself, so uh, you get to you get to hear me for the whole book. <laughs> Great. And if folks want to follow you and your work, where should they go? I have a I have a, a newsletter. Um, it, it's uh, it's called Strategic Intelligence. So if you just Google uh, Jim Bricker Strategic Intelligence, you'll come to the landing page. I'm very active on Twitter. My account is at James G Rickards, uh, all one word. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jim. Really look forward to having you back on the program and good luck with the book. Thanks, Adam. Well, now's the time in the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the financial advisory partners endorsed by Wealthion. Uh, I'm joined today, as usual, by Mike Preston and John Loderick. Guys, let's jump right into it. Mike, let's start with you. Um, I imagine much of what uh, Jim said is probably pretty copacetic with how you guys look at the world, but, but what's your key takeaways from this conversation? I really enjoyed that talk, Adam. Uh, Jim is, a, is a, just a legend on Wall Street. You know, goes back to um, the the bailout of long term capital management in 1998, and obviously his his career goes back beyond that. But he J- Jim's a very smart guy. And he's been around Wall Street a long time, and you know, when you asked him about the global financial situation, we we've got to com- completely agree the economy is definitely weakening. And we're almost certainly in a recession. He talked a lot about recession and the technicalities of how GDP is measured. But you know, we're almost certainly in a recession or going into one soon. And the, the, the market is priced for nothing near that. The stock market right now is still priced at bubble levels, just barely touching the levels reached at the pr- prior peaks in the tech bubble, for instance, and certainly higher than the peak in uh, 2008, before the housing crisis really uh, started off in full force. So, and, and Jim says this is more than just a slowdown. He thinks that we're going to have more, more like a catastrophe. And I, I try not to be too negative and too doomish, but I can't help it. This, you know, the bubble that we've lived through is just so massive. And all we've seen is maybe a 20% pullback in the S&P. It's very unlikely that we're going to get off so easy. We probably are going into more of a catastrophic downturn, or at least more than your garden variety slowdown. You know, that's what Jim was talking about. And he talked a lot about a liquidity crisis. He likened this to what happened in 2008. I, I'm not sure. I, uh, I I don't know that we see that in, in complete parallel. For instance, I think that uh, the mortgage loans back then were poorly un- underwritten and so forth. But he talks about a number of different metrics that you can't argue with, like an inverted yield curve, which is a pretty stark warning about some a looming recession and potential liquidity problems. So he sees this as a liquidity crisis, and we mostly agree. And um, and then he then he talks about the Fed. You know, he says the only thing the Fed can do right at this point is to stop raising rates. And yet he he thinks, like I think most of Wall Street thinks, that today in, in less than an hour, as we're as we're recording this, the Fed is going to announce a rate hike, probably 0.75% or 75 basis points. And then in December, probably another 75 or 50 is what Jim said. So who knows? Most of that is pretty much baked into the cake already. If you look at bond prices, they're way down and yields are, are, are way up. On the 10-year yield is somewhere around 4.2%. And mortgages are above 7% on the 30-year fixed. So it, we, in summary, we're probably very early in a recession or right at the doorstep of it. The bear market probably just got started. We're down 20% from the all-time high. 
Uh, we are almost certainly, in our view, in a bear market, and it should last a lot longer, and it'll be more, it'll be stronger than your garden variety bear market. Nobody knows exactly how far it could go, but losing 50% from the top or even 50% from here wouldn't be out of the question, just given how extreme a lot of the metrics have been. So Jim uh, talked a lot more about other things, but I'll leave you some space to ask some other questions and I'll pause there for a moment. For a moment. All right. Um, I, I want to get in a minute to um, you know Jim's uh, portfolio allocation that he mentioned there, because um, I, I, I see there's some similarities with what you guys are doing, but would love to get your reaction to that. Um, before we get there, John, anything to tack on to Mike's comments there in terms of your sort of top takeaways? Yeah, not much. I think Mike did a good job encapsulating Jim's comments. He is a legend. Uh, he's been in on the front lines of crises uh, that in, in many ways uh, ushered in the modern era of central bank activism, the long-term capital management crisis of the late 90s. Um, you know, I think Jim talked about um, the reality that a lot of the ramifications of the Fed tightening thus far uh, have typically will take time to work through the system. Um, you know, in terms of unemployment being a lagging indicator, you know, oftentimes really taking up much at, you know, well after a recession is, is well underway. Uh, just, just the, you know, we've heard that refrain from others and we, we tend to agree. We think the rosiness is still very evident in stock prices and, and other things. The ramifications of the inflation that we've had and, and the, the, um, increase the cost of capital, we think still has yet to kind of ripple through. You've used the analogy of the the Python, I think, uh, swallowing a, a goat, uh, Adam, you know, slowly moves through the system. We agree. So I think that's at the heart of why Jim thinks the Fed probably could and should maybe pause here, which is, I want to I want to be careful to point out that that's not a pivot. Many people think pause equals pivot. In other words, let's start, you know, dispensing the morphine again. Uh, he thinks a pause, if they were to do it, whether now or even a year from now, maybe a pause for a year or more. Uh, in other words, not going right back towards, you know, the easy, easy money that we've come to know. Um, so, yeah, we think uh, and Mike touched upon this. You know, we think there's plenty of, of um, you know, nasty stuff still to be priced in the markets that's not reflected yet. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it, it was just a, a very well-informed and, and uh, broad perspective that he brought to the discussion. Okay. And let me just pull on the term liquidity crisis for a second and try to help people really understand that. So, uh, you know, think of liquidity as like the oil in the engine, right? You need to have it for the gears to turn well. And what we had back in, in say, 2008 is we, we, we had a uh, basically a, a lack of oil in the system, right? We just had the credit that, that flows to the economy, just those flows just began stopping for a variety of reasons, primarily because nobody really knew where their, their worst risk lay. And so you had parties that would otherwise normally happily lend to each other, start reining in those that, that lending because they just weren't sure if they were going to get paid back or not. Um, and this is something that sort of plays upon itself as, as um, you know, stress levels and uncertainty gets higher. Right. Um, and so uh, you we're already beginning to see sort of signs of liquidity um, being low in the system, both in terms of just the trading of the general markets, but even in, in otherwise extremely deep markets like the U.S. Treasury market. Um, we've had Janet Yellen come out relatively recently and, and issue warnings that we're seeing, you know, a his, a relatively historic low levels of liquidity there, which are then resulting in higher volatility. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing signs that, you know, players around the world are getting nervous and these flows are beginning to slow. Of course, the central banks, most of the central banks around the world are contributing to that because they have been pumping liquidity into the system over the past decade. And now they're actually actively removing it from the system. It's that that's now policy. Um, so, uh, if, if we get to, um, the type of future that Jim was talking about, um, you know, we could see asset prices falling. We could see uh, debt defaults increasing. Uh, and again, that's those are just things that are going to make players more nervous, less likely to to uh, to, to lend to one another freely. Um, and if the central banks do not pivot at that point in time, um, they're continuing to keep oil from entering the system here. 
Um, so that's the kind of danger that we're talking about. John, I sort of see you nodding as I'm saying all this, but I'm just trying to make this sort of liquidity crisis understandable in people's mind. And of course, the danger there is if the entire engine seizes up and just nobody starts doing business with each other, um, that's where like basically the economy just kind of stops. I'm not necessarily saying that that's going to happen, but that's the danger that everybody's afraid of in that type of scenario. So any any other clarity you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that's a really kind of fascinating uh, element of where we are right now. Um, if you go back to 2008, 2009, the housing crisis, the, the liquidity uh, emanated from really kind of toxic stuff, you know, subprime mortgages and, and related things like that, um, you know, uh, default uh, swaps, things like that. Um, right now, there's not much talk uh, of crisis or liquidity crisis, and even, even things like the junk bond corporate debt market or, or things like that you know actually quite ironically or not ironically but but uh, quite remarkably the 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 liquidity crisis that's being talked about today and you know kind of murmurs but but with more more emphasis is in the sovereign debt markets you know we saw a revolt happen in the UK in the in the bond market the gilts there absolutely got pummeled and forced a a, a rather abrupt policy uh, freak out there uh, we're seeing the Japanese um, uh, sovereign debt market really get into fritz. You know, uh, the the Japanese have instituted what they call yield yield curve control, where they're basically going to go and, and and buy aggressively ten year Japanese government bonds to try to keep the yield below a certain target rate. Well, the thirty year bond has has blown out through the roof on yields, uh, basically as a more or less a bond revolt. Uh, and, and more recently, Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary, has talked about uh, her concerns about liquidity in the Treasury market. So it's quite interesting to me that we're not even talking about liquidity problems in the corporate junk bond market, but it's about the, you know, the real plumbing of, of the, 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 the global economy and, and financing of government debts and monetary policy. That, that to me is quite remarkable. And on top of that, if we do get kind of the steep recession uh, that you know, folk, folks like Jim Rickards talk about, um, then we're likely to see piled onto that crises in all these other areas like junk debt uh, and, you know, junk corporate bonds. So so it is a, a, a really ominous thing that I don't think is, is fully um, been appreciated uh, as a consequence of the last decade. Okay. And that, that's what I was going to ask is, is, is it is it blindness right now? Because it's not like junk corporate debt is is safer or more stable than sovereign debt, right? I mean, like, you know, if, if we're having trouble in these sovereign bond markets and it really manifests, well, then probably all these zombie companies that are, you know, basically have been kept alive by junk debt. I mean, they're going to be one of the first casualties in that, I would imagine. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of that that pig mo moving through the python. You know, probably the, the piper has not been paid yet um, uh, as a result of inflationary driven decreased sales at some of these companies or, you know, they're having to roll over debt at, at now higher rates. That takes time for those kinds of things to, to work through the system. So we probably just haven't seen the pain points emerge yet that will likely will. And um, certainly a deep recession would would cause some of those to, to come to the fore. Yeah. And, you know, so and Mike, I'm coming to you here. So Jim talked about how he is very skeptical of the argument that inflation is going to be uh, more stubborn than people think. Uh, and it's going to persist for a lot longer, despite a number of the very august experts we've had on this channel recently who, who who think that it may. But, you know, Jim made the distinction between cost push inflation and demand pull inflation. And, um, you know, basically just said, look, I think all those they're all the recessionary forces we're dealing with right now are going to drag CPI down pretty quickly. And the real battle that we're going to have next year is going to be a, a disinflationary and deflationary one. And inflation may almost kind of be you know, a historical fact by that point in time. Um, I just did an interview this morning with Stephanie Pomboy, who shares Jim's point of view on this. And uh, hopefully many viewers have watched that before today's videos come out. But um, I mean, she makes a, a very compelling case basically for the, the same thing. Um, so John just mentioned that, you know, going into a severe recession could be the trigger that sort of ignites uh, the instability that we're talking about in terms of uh, liquidity continuing to dry up. Um, do you, what, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, uh, deflation and recession next year? 
I would say that for a long time, even the last few years, we thought that a deflationary impulse was was the real risk and the likely thing to happen. I, I'll tell you that I was somewhat surprised at just how how high inflation spiked and how fast it did post COVID. Looking back, I shouldn't be surprised seeing that there was nearly seven trillion dollars of, of new money created and just thrown into the system. At the same time, we weren't letting people really go out, so they were just buying things on the internet, you know? So, I mean, it, obviously it caused this inflation. The question is, is it going to be here to stay? A lot of people are afraid that it's going to be here to stay. Um, personally, I think that it's likely that we see a quick pullback in inflation, at least to the four to 5% in the next six to nine months. Past that, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not totally sure. However, my inclination towards thinking that we're not only in a recession, but very likely a pretty historic bear market, um, you know, leads me to believe that we're going to see some pretty big asset price crashes, particularly in the stock market. And the housing market will be impacted too, even if less than the stock market. And so it's hard to imagine that we're going to have an asset price decline if we're right about that, without uh, imagining that uh, inflation is going to be hit hard and driven back down towards the zero level, and maybe even into negative. And once it goes into negative, you're talking deflation. So I, I think there's a very good chance that we might see deflation at the um, kind of kind of like the peak of the economic decline or crisis that we're likely to have in the next year to two. And if that happens, it's going to be a great time to own cash and uh, long-term high-quality bonds. So uh, yeah, I think the market's probably overreacted. We just saw, uh, as you were doing uh, on your on your program, Adam, you were telling people about the I bonds which had a cutoff last Friday at, I think, 9.6%. They're still paying, I think, 6 or so percent, if I, if I could remember, for the next it's six, six months. 6.8 6 something. So it's actually closer to 7, which is still, still pretty, pretty good. Nice. Still pretty good. And yes, it's only for the first six months, but not a bad deal if you don't need the money anytime soon. Um, but you are limited to $10,000 a year. Uh, it, it, to me, per person, when we, per year, just commenting on the videos I mentioned in terms of how you can actually end up getting a lot more than that. That's, as a family. that's true. Yeah. There are ways to do it. And you talked about gift box and there's, there's the very different, there's ways you can actually have more. Um, um, and you can do that. But once you, once you reach those limits, you're, you're kind of capped out in that idea. And so the big money is in, you know, the, the institutionally, the big money is in the bond market. The bond market is four or five times bigger than the stock market. And a lot of that money is going to try to nail down long-term rates at or near where they are right now, 10-year yield at 4.2 or so. And that should provide a lift for bonds. So, yeah, I think this, this may be better than an even chance that we see inflation trend back towards zero and even go negative for a short time in the next year or so. So deflationary risks are definitely there. And you want to be in cash or, or in high-quality bonds when that happens. All right. So and now let's get to Jim's allocation. So. Um, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, Jim basically is all about diversification, right? So uh, Jim is talking about, um, you know, owning owning a bit of everything, right? You know, even a diversified portfolio of stocks is still just stocks, right? Um, but he talked about, um, obviously, cash starting with, and that now is a time to be owning more cash than normal for the reasons that you just mentioned there, Mike. Um, he said about 10% gold. Um, uh, in stocks, uh, he really likes, um, you know, the, the producers, commodity producers, oil majors in particular, um, but also, you know, some real estate, farmland, if you can get it, private equity, if you can get it. Um, but then obviously also owning some stocks and bonds, um, a little more bearish on stocks right now, besides the commodity producers, a little more bullish on bonds right now for the reasons that you just mentioned there, Mike, um, John, anything that you want to comment about about uh, Jim's allocation there? Yeah, I re really would like to highlight his uh, definition of diversification because that may not come out so so clearly to most listeners. Um, most financial firms and in the industry itself consider diversification as you know some mix of stocks and bonds. You know, might be maybe it's seventy thirty if you're a certain age, or it's thirty percent stocks, seventy percent bonds if you're another age. But the, the concept of, of diversification is this pie chart of traditional, you know, stocks and bonds, maybe some token allocation to broad commodities, you know, something like 2% or something like that. And I think the point he was trying to make is that that's not really diversification, certainly not in, in this uh, 
modern environment where everything has been goosed by uh, central bank policies. You know, look at this year, for example, both stocks and bonds, which were, have always been thought of as counterbalances to each other, have gotten pummeled, right? Um, in, in true diversification is when you have non-correlated assets, um, things that move uh, opposite of one another. So when you talk about cash, that's a non-correlated asset with the stock and bond markets. And not only that, but it's actually yielding some uh, some meaningful yield right now and provides the option value, the, the true option value, which is a, a very um, elusive but quantifiable value of being able to convert that cash to uh, other things at lower prices should they occur. Uh, things like um, the natural resources in the, in the land, the farmland, th these are all, um, you know, some of the pricing of that did get caught up in this, this asset bubble fueled by by um, quantitative easing and stuff like that. But but these are true diversifications. I would add to that hedged strategies, you know, taking traditional stocks and bonds or other traditional assets and augmenting the risk reward equation uh, by using hedging tools. That that is a form of diversification in and of itself because it 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 kind of augments or or modifies the risk profile, the risk reward profile in, a, in an intentional way. Um, so I just wanted to call out because that that's really important, I think, for fo for folks to understand. Yeah, and uh, John, uh, you know, we have you on this program because you guys are financial advisors that take into account the macro issues that. I talked about with Jim and we talk about with all the guests on this channel every week. Um, is that type of helping somebody think about how to create a truly diversified uh, set of holdings conversations that you guys have when when people call you? It, it absolutely is. And, and we kind of quip that, you know, sometimes we do a really good job at telling people to, to do things with their money other than to have us manage it. Uh, so that involves paying off debt. Um, you know, restructuring their their balance sheet at home, um, which can be very sensible, can be very wise, one of the wisest uh, financial decisions you can make right now, maybe even more important than how you invest, right, depending on the circumstances. So yeah, we, we think those are all parts of the equation. You know, our, our bottom line is we, we as, as important as financial assets are to most households in this country, there are plenty of other areas that are important that we counsel them on, you know, um, building some resiliency into their career path and, and uh, a lot of different intangibles that we think are really part of an equation that certainly affect their financial assets and, and how those, those play out. But um, the, the stock portfolio isn't the be all and end all of a happy life uh, is, is the way we, we imagine things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talked about a little of this yesterday and yesterday's uh, monthly Q and a, um, but, but, but fair to say that your guys's role is to talk with people about the full spectrum of wealth in their lives, come up with a plan for that, and then say, okay, we can specifically help you with the financial asset side of it, but we've, we're have we plugging that into a bigger vision. Yeah, absolutely, Adam. It's, it's, uh, they're all intertwined. It, these are people's lives that, that are attached to this money, so of course. All right. So um, as we start to sort of wrap things up here, uh, Mike, you said that, uh, uh, you know, in a couple of minutes, actually, it's too bad we, we didn't have the opportunity to record this a little bit later, but we're going to find out what uh, the Fed has to say this time around. Um, we'll have to pick up that thread next week in terms of uh, whatever aftermath there is from, from the comments. But as best we can tell, Fed's probably going to raise 75 basis points. Um, and I guess everybody will be looking to see whether um, Powell shows any moderation in terms of his forward guidance, uh, in terms of, you know, continued rate hikes and, and whatnot. But, you know, I'll let you opine on two things. Um, one is, you know, I know we're, you and I, and probably everybody watching this are just so exhausted of an environment where what really drives everything is what comes out of Jerome Powell's mouth. Um, we, 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 we all yearn for the day where we can all just be investors in looking at, you know, market forces and what's, how particular companies are faring well in their sectors and try to pick the right winners. Um, but so far still it's central bank policy that continues to really drive all the price action. Um, and then second to, to Jim's comment about, in his opinion, the best thing the Fed could do is just sit on its hands at this point, that, that any continued hiking from here and tightening uh, is probably setting ourselves up for more pain as we tip over into the disinflationary deflationary side of things, and we're actually making that problem even worse 
by the incremental hikes that are being made right now. So uh, love your thoughts on concluding thoughts on, on both those issues. Yeah, I know that Jim says the Fed might be making a mistake by continuing to tighten here because they might exacerbate the downturn. But in my view, they're actually finally doing the right thing, potentially, you know, by normalizing policy or at least appearing to be normalizing policy. And you're right. We're all exhausted talking about the Fed and only the Fed all the time. So it would be nice. It would be really nice if um, if that wasn't the case. I don't see that being reality, at least not without some kind of financial crisis. Because we're just not going to change until we until we have a crisis, and then if we have a crisis, well, we're going to look and, and say, well, what caused the crisis? If the crisis is deep enough, maybe the Fed will get blamed. That wouldn't be a bad thing because that's actually who is to blame. So you know, we'll see. I I I think that Powell is pretty committed to continuing on this. I think that he's, I'm sure, got a tap on the shoulder and he's being told to get inflation down. And I really don't think there's going to be any. Uh, material easing or pivot until we see much lower stock prices. The Fed put is probably much lower than where we are now. We'll see. I might be wrong. Um, you know, to me, that would be below 3,000 on the S&P minimum. If you look at the charts of the S&P, technically, we're, we're, we're in a counter trend bounce right now. It started a few weeks ago. It's been a very sharp bounce, about 12% in two and a half weeks or so, even sharper than the June bounce that we saw. So here's a market that's bouncing off absolute technical support zones and just getting these what they call rip your face rallies um, that go vertical and has everyone convinced that the worst is over. Probably not the truth. Probably not the truth. I wouldn't be surprised if the market turns right here, right around bedtime. We'll see. I might eat those words, but I'm, I'm not afraid of saying that technically this looks like a good time to roll over and accelerate downwards. So um, I'm not sure I answered the first part of your question, but um, I, I'm not sure I did, but the second part is, yeah, I don't really see that there's going to be much, um, you know, much change. It's going to be 75 basis points in some kind of neutral language. And, um, I think the bear market continues and hopefully that's what changes our focus on the Fed. Okay. Um, and I, I do want to ask you guys any recent trades that you may have made. So I'll get to that in just a second. <clears throat> um, but, uh, in the earlier discussion that I did with Stephanie Pomboy, um, I used the term uh, uh, Roach Motel. And and what I meant by that was, you know, in yesterday's uh, monthly Q&A with you guys and, and Lance Roberts, you know, it was the, the, the potential, not, not, not the probability necessarily, but the potential for stocks to continue rally from here going into the end of the year, you know, the resumption of a Santa Claus rally, um, the fact that markets, you know, uh, it did get really oversold. And, and so there was a bunch of cash on the sidelines that that some of these institutions have to deploy. Um, again, there, there, you can make some reasons for why capital could be coming into the markets, pushing prices up over the next month or two. Um, if that were to happen, uh, my question to Stephanie was, would, 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 would that, you know, would that make the market sort of a roach motel where, all the people on the sidelines think, okay, finally the downturn's over. We, we, we put an end to this horrible 2022 year where we had one of the worst years ever for stocks and bonds. Looks like the market's getting beyond that. So now it's time to get back in and deploy only to have all this stuff just roll over you know, at the start of 2023. So Mike, maybe we'll stick with you. Um, I assume you would say, yeah, if, if, if prices are going up like that, don't be don't be lured back in with fresh capital. Use those prices uh, as a chance to sell. Yeah, that's right. That's that's what's tricky about this market. The truth is, Adam, nobody knows for sure. We don't know for sure. We're professionals. We don't know. We could get another blow off top. And, um, you know, that would be uncomfortable for people that have been prudent and have been warning about a bear market. But sure, it's possible. Sentiment can change quickly. Maybe the Fed does pivot. Maybe that causes... Uh, and maybe they pivot in a, in a big way with their language and actions. Maybe that causes a blow off top. Maybe that causes the herd to stampede in one last time. We know, though, that this market for a long time, more than 10 years, actually probably 20 years, has been relied, reliant on a, on a perpetual bubble in terms of valuations just to continue going. Every time the market normalizes and comes back to a Schiller price earnings ratio, for instance, that's more of an average valuation. 
you know, that's 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 a move that almost ends the world, like in the bottom in March 2009, and the central bank comes in and rescues it again. So maybe, maybe there'll be one more hurrah. But if it is, it's not going to be a healthy thing. It's not something that you should chase. It's not something that we will chase, other than maybe some slices of exposure in sectors that look strong with some very tight hedges. That's to say that we we won't go all in. You re, to make big money or big returns, you have to you have to go all in. They call Jesse Livermore the plunger for a reason. He wasn't afraid to go in or with leverage even <clears throat> to make big returns. The problem with plunging in anything is it can wipe you out. So when we have extremely high valuation, speculative fever, maybe we would take some small slices uh, of exposure, but not much. So, um, but to, to me, all the technicals still point down. So, you know, expecting a blow off top is just kind of a hope and a prayer at this point. And I would just sit back and look and see what happens. All right. Well, really well said. Well, John, real quick, um, any trades you guys have placed on recently? I remember you guys were talking a week or two ago that you put, um, I think, a new long, maybe energy trade on. Um, but yeah. anyways, what well, have you guys done recently? Yeah, so we, we the construct here, is, as Mike kind of alluded and talked about, you know, we do think we're in a bear market where there's the propensity for these face face ripping rallies. That's how they typically always happen in, in bear markets. Uh, and and this, so far this this year has played out. Uh, very, very textbook for that kind of scenario. So yeah, we do want to take some tactical opportunities where we can. So we have, for example, in the last few weeks, uh, we added a slice of uh, a broad market index um, focusing on the, the mid to smaller caps, which have held up on a relative strength basis far better than some of the large cap index indices. Um, we actually just exited that trade uh, yesterday. It was a very um, modest trade. It was it was you know hedged very tightly um, to to the extent to which if we were early in in calling that near term bottom, which we perfectly are capable of being wrong in the timing. That's that's a that's an impossible task to get it perfect. Um, that trade would have had the effect of of protecting clients for roughly about an additional ten percent downside. There is no free lunch, of course. We've given up some upside on this uh, on this recent bounce. We didn't capture all the, all the recent bounce, and in fact, we exited that position yesterday. Uh, the, the, because of the position size of, of that uh, trade, not all of our client accounts could get it. It had to have a certain account size to have the economics of that trade or the mechanics of that trade work out. But we also have uh, added uh, incrementally to emerging markets for some clients that were underweight that uh, to our to our goals. Um, you know, broadly speaking, but also some Latin America, Latin America focus there. We do like, we have liked, we do continue to like emerging markets, certainly from a, a broader evaluation standpoint. And um, yeah, so those are some modest trades we've done recently. Um, you know, however, we are looking for, you know, much better opportunities to, to, to put uh, the ample amounts of cash that we're holding for clients to work. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know, and again, these, these, these are modest sized positions because you're still cash heavy because you're so concerned about the, the current outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, in the emerging markets um, sleeve, uh, I, I believe because we had Tavi Costa on not that long ago, and he was really surprisingly to him bullish on Brazil. You guys, I think, were looking at Brazil pretty closely too, correct? Yeah, we actually did put a, a piece of, of Brazil uh, in with, with some call options against it to bring some some buffer on volatility. And of course, it's a small, we, we intentionally made it a small position size as, as technically constructive and fundamentally constructive as we like the, the sectors and the underlying economy, uh, you know, industries in, in the Brazilian economy. There is quite a headline grabbing uh, political event going on there right now with the recent uh, you know, upset victory of of uh, Belisario, uh, and and you know, so far uh, a muted uh, but seemingly order orderly um, intent to have the the power seed, but there's enough uh, opaqueness there that there's there's people holding their breath as to whether this will be a orderly succession of power. So um, we're not uh, blind to the you know potential political backdrop there and the and the volatility that may cause for that injury. right. And when people talk about country risk, that's a good example of the type of risk you want to take into account. Was EWZ, was that the ETF that you guys were looking at for that? Yeah, we we, we generally try to stay away from tickers I, uh, just because that, that gets into a realm of of regulatory disclosure that we probably would need to splash some. But, you know, th there aren't too many ETFs that uh, that track uh, the Brazil market. So, you know, that would be 
uh, you know, certainly inadequate for th for folks wanting to get exposure to that space. That would be an adequate uh, and very proper way to to get exposure to it. All right, I'm going to talk about another ticker too, Mike. I'm going to come to you. Uh, we've talked about it in this program before, but TLT um, uh, people are a number of the recent discussions on this program, including yesterday that we had. Um, you know, a lot of the, the experts in the program have been saying, uh, Jim included, that, hey, bonds are looking pretty attractive here, both not just from the returns that they're finally offering, but the fact um, that, you know, longer duration bonds have sort of an option value uh, priced in that if if we even have a Fed pause, let alone a pivot, um, that those bonds are probably going to likely increase in price um, as a response to that policy change. Um, and the longer duration bonds respond more, you know, more extremely in terms of their response. Um, so, t you know, TLT has been a, a, a an ETF that we've been tracking on this program for for months now with you guys and other people, and it has, you know, continued to kind of get beaten up. It's looking here like it maybe could have put in a bottom at ninety two. I think it's above ninety seven uh, today. Um, but I guess my my general question is is what what's your guys' outlook right now on um, long term U.S. Treasuries? And we can talk about TLT as a substitute for that. But but however you want to talk about them. Yeah, the same disclosure here that any discussion about a single ETF is not a recommendation, and there's many ways to play an idea. But the uh, TLT is a widely followed um, ETF, and it's something that people can look at um, as a proxy for what the long term bond is doing. Long-term bond has been absolutely pummeled, you know, in, in this in this country and in other countries, like John talked about earlier. The UK 50-year gilt was down a ridiculous amount in a short period of time. And the long-term bond here in the US is down close to 50% now from, from the high, just looking at a quick chart here. And uh, if you look at TLT, again, as a proxy for the longer term U.S. bonds, it's lost a third of its value from the beginning of the year. So long term, high quality bonds are down more than stocks. So, so a 60-40 portfolio is under a lot of pressure. However, the better opportunity, in our view, uh, in that 60-40 mix is, is bonds uh, over stocks. Bonds have gotten really, really hammered and probably more so than they deserve. It seems like the whole world, the whole trading world has been selling the heck out of long-term bonds and buying short-term bonds, perhaps front running or trying to predict what the Fed's doing on the short end of the curve, because the Fed can really only can control short rates, not long rates. But again, as we said earlier, as a recession or even deflation or even depression, can't predict the depression, but if it were to happen, everybody would be tripping over themselves to lock in long-term high quality rates. And you could see long-term bonds go way up. Um, there, there's a concept in, in, in bond calculators called duration. And it's, you know, to, to put it in layman's terms, it has something to do with like the weighted average of the total amount of income you get over the, the period of the bond plus the terminal payment of your money back. So like a 30-year bond has something like a 22 or a 23, 24-year duration. A 10-year bond has eight or nine year duration. Duration is usually slightly less than the stated maturity because of the net, the net present value of the interest payments that you get. Well, if you look at interest rates and if you, if you wanna come up with a quick rule of thumb on how much bond prices will change, uh, if you look at the duration of an asset, so on, on TLT, for instance, has a duration of around 20 years. For every 1% move in interest rates, that asset will move 10%. So a 1% decline in rates, that asset will move up 10%, so on and so forth. So if long bonds went to 3%, you'd expect at least a 10% pop in long bonds. It probably would be more. Um, it, it probably would be a little bit more, but it's just a quick rule of thumb. So yes, we think that long bonds are, are, are likely going to get a big bid when it becomes clear that the Fed's slowing down, that we're going into a recession and or deflation, um, you know, any, any one of those things. And a lot of your guests agree, and this is not to say that we're in an echo chamber, but Jim just said he likes the 10-year bond a lot. Can't argue with that. And a lot of other guests on your program in the last few months. So yeah, it makes sense for a portion of your portfolio. We've got about 15% there. 
And we were a little early, we'll admit it, it's been painful to be a little bit early, but we think that uh, there's gonna be a very big bounce there. All right, so uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Um, but gents, um, well said, Mike, and, and bond math in general, it tends to be harder for the average investor to wrap their brain around. Um, and so it's another reason why you know we think, given all of the uncertainty that Jim laid out there for us um, as a given, um, you know, it, this is a very tough time for investors, individual investors to figure out how to navigate. And this is why we, we say people should work with a financial advisor that takes all of these macro issues into consideration. If you're deciding, hey, I want to, you know, potentially learn more about bonds and, and maybe maybe consider adding a greater allocation to them in my portfolio, um, unless you're experienced trading bonds yourself, again, highly recommend you work in partnership with a financial advisor who's experienced with them, who can explain it all to you and help you come up with a strategy that's a good fit given your goals and your risk tolerance and, and all that stuff. Because again, a lot of that bond math doesn't come intuitively to a lot of people. Um, if you want to do that, um, we highly recommend if you've got a good advisor to do this with, great, just work with them. But if you don't, consider talking to one of the ones that Wealthion endorses on this channel, maybe even Mike and John and the team at New Harbor. Uh, themselves. And to do that, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the quick short form there. Um, all right, as we wrap things up here, folks, um, uh, as we've been doing for the past couple of months now, I continue to write up my key takeaways from these discussions with each of our guests. So if you want to get my notes from uh, the discussion here with Jim for free, just go to Wealthion.com slash Adam's notes. You can get them there. Um, and uh, if you like seeing Big names like Jim on this program would like to see him back on again and would like to see uh, you know, other great guests of his caliber on the program too. Please support us by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right uh, right next to it uh and uh you know whatever whatever happens next folks especially we're going to find out in a couple minutes what the fed says um we'll be deconstructing it for folks here on this program uh next week uh and guys um you have a free webinar coming up in the not too distant future right about uh explaining how to how to use options as a hedging technique guys is that right yeah we, we're working on that right now adam we we uh, are in the calendar to get that recorded with you and uh we're we're working furiously to put something that's uh understandable because options can get quite complex and we we just wanted to provide an educational resources to understand how options can be used it's not going to be at all trading advice there's going to be disclaimers galore in it because there needs to be but uh, we hope to illuminate for your viewers and our clients and, and prospective clients that watch you know, just some of the basics that that we deal with every day in, in uh, using options as hedging tools. All right. Um, I've got on my calendar that we're trying to um, have this webinar the night of uh, Monday, November 14th. I just want to mention that so people can kind of just put on their calendars. Um, is that right? Did I get the right date there, guys? That's correct. I think 7 p.m. Eastern, I believe, on the 14th. Great. Uh, and folks, um, I'll just give you a URL if you want to go kind of, you know, bookmark it. Uh, you can put in wealthion.com slash options hedging. Um, and uh, that'll get you to the video once we've actually uh, released it. Um, but of course, as we get closer to the date, we'll, we'll remind folks of that. But I did just want to get this on folks' radar so that they're interested in this topic. Uh, they can plan for it on their, their calendars in mid-November. Um, all right, guys. Well, look, thanks so much for giving us again so much of your time and helping uh, everybody make sense of this very uh, confusing and fast-changing time in the markets. Um, look forward to seeing you guys here next week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. Another great uh, session, Adam. Thanks so much. And we'll see you soon. See you next week. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment 
or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.